happening to all of us. And we are one big hive, and we need to start to act from one big hive mind and get more like bees. Genevieve Dretches from Bee Haven Farm in Worcester, Vermont, speaks out about the environmental crisis facing bees. We'll be talking with her later in this special Earth Day broadcast. Certain fertilizers, when you spread certain pesticides, you are um, spreading trouble for pollinators. When you spread certain pesticides, you're spreading trouble for pollinators. So says Representative Jim McCullough when we caught up with him at an interview earlier this week. If it takes three years for the soil to return to health, doesn't that say something? Mike Ball, a land stewardship practitioner, speaks with us about how the climate crisis affects pollinators and offers some organic solutions. And unfortunately, those millimeter waves are about the same size as our pollinators. So it's going to be completely overwhelming for our pollinators. Last but not least, Cece Doucette from Massachusetts for Safe Technology will be sharing information about wireless impacts on bees and other pollinators. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Live from the Hive, a special Earth Day pollinator report. I'm Ava Purdy. And I'm Amelia Sercosta. Here's our headlines. Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador has given farmers until 2024 to stop using glyphosate. A growing body of scientific research shows the glyphosate herbicide to be especially toxic to butterflies. Indeed, it's toxic to all pollinators and has been shown to cause cancer in humans. In response, industry lobbyists have been working closely with U.S. officials to pressure Mexico into dropping its intended ban on glyphosate the key ingredient in Monsanto's Roundup weed killer. As the Mexican president stated, our country must be oriented towards establishing sustainable and culturally adequate agricultural practices that are healthy and safe for the environment. Let's demand that the United States government and President Biden commit to ban the glyphosate used by 2024 as well. Don't you think so, Ava? Yes, I agree. Let's stop glyphosate use worldwide, period. Butterflies are an endangered species, and glyphosate use is killing them by the billions. It is also killing many other species, including humans. Our next headline concerns another endangered pollinator, bats. The Insect Control District of Addison and Rutland Counties in Vermont has been spraying the pesticides malathion and permethrin to kill mosquitoes and their Endangered Species Committee biologists have voted unanimously that this poses a risk to endangered bats. As bats fly to the chemical plume of pesticides, they inhale the toxic droplets, absorb them through their wings, or later ingest them by grooming themselves or other bats. They also catch and eat flying insects contaminated with the pesticides. These pesticides are known to cause neurological and physiological damage to bats. Activities that involve a risk of injury to endangered species in Vermont are illegal. Hence, a recent memo from the Endangered Species Committee biologists recommending that Vermont Agency of Natural Resources Secretary Julie Moore require the Insect Control District to apply for a special permit outlining how the activity should be modified to reduce the risk. Shockingly, though, Moore is not legally required to follow that recommendation. And there is no other state agency or regulation that can compel the Insect Control District to reduce the risk to endangered bats. If the Agency of Natural Resources takes no action, it is effectively granting permission to continue harming bats. Not to mention embedding a standard of inaction on every other endangered species issue that comes up. There is much at risk when our leaders make important decisions in defiance of strong scientific consensus. Every independent biologist who has addressed this issue agrees. The risk to, of endangered bats demands a permit from the Agency of Natural Resources. Secretary Moore must decide between following the science or ignoring it. We urge her to listen to the scientists. Live from the Hive strongly believes that toxic chemicals should not be allowed for mitigating insect problems. There are many other solutions. Extinction is forever and bats are endangered. A warning to our listeners and viewers. The following story contains disturbing images and facts relating to the death, decline, and extinction of many precious pollinator species on our planet. 
Since the 1970s, the North American continent has lost 3 billion birds, nearly 30% of the total. More than 90% of the losses, over 2.5 billion birds, come from just 12 families, including the sparrows, blackbirds, warblers, and finches. The losses include favorite species seen at bird feeders, such as, such as dark-eyed juncos or snowbirds, down by 168 million, sweet-singing white-throated sparrows, down by 93 million, eastern and western meadowlarks, down by a combined 139 million, even beloved red-winged blackbird populations, a common sight in virtually every marsh and wet roadside across the continent, have declined by 92 million birds. The population of the Western monarch butterfly fell below 10,000 in fall 2020, compared with millions in the 1980s and 300,000 just five years ago. Despite this decline of 99% in the past 40 years, Western monarch butterflies have been denied endangered species listing. Eastern monarchs, famous for their 3,000 mile migration to central Mexico, are also in trouble. Their numbers have declined by over 85% in the past 40 years. Bat populations have been declining for decades, but recent threats such as white nose syndrome have accelerated the declines in the U.S. At least 5.5 million bats have died from this disease since 2006. Some eight species, or 18% of North American bats, are at risk of extinction. An additional six species, or 13%, are potentially at risk, making bats one of the most threatened groups of terrestrial vertebrates in North America, more than birds, lizards, snakes, and mammals. Bats are the second most diverse group of mammals on Earth and play a critical role in the maintenance of healthy ecosystems. When we come back, our featured stories. Interviews with a beekeeper, a legislator, a soil scientist, and an EMF radiation expert. Stay with us. If not for them, there is no doubt We would have to do without We would have to let go of Foods we need and love Pollinator, pollinator, pollinator It is your nature to fly by Aero Vino and Emily Lansner. A few days ago, I spoke with Genevieve Drutches from Bee Haven Farm in Worcester, Vermont, about the environmental crisis facing bees. We're already really concerned about what this season is going to be like in 2021. Last drought summer, the 2020 season, was really difficult on the bees. And what's happening right now with this really drastic early spring is the bees look like they would normally look at the end of May, except the things that are there for them, like dandelions and other blossoms early in the season, aren't present for them. Thank you so much for joining us at The Hive. We're really uh, excited to learn more about you and your bees from such an experienced beekeeper. So before we start, I just, I have a jar of your honey that you gave to us a few days ago and while I taste it, can you tell us a little more about it? That's honey from last 2020 season, and it's from our home apiary where we don't really do honey production, but we do graft queen bees. And so it's unusual honey in the sense that it's not made from open fields with Vermont wildflowers and some of the things that bees normally feed on in Vermont, like alfalfa and trefoil. That honey is made from things more like maple flowers in the woods, um, wild asters, bone sets, eupatoriums, more wildflowers that bees aren't normally foraging on for honey. And that also has a lot of Japanese knotweed in it. Because the knotweed has spread as a species so much in Vermont, we have a lot of it in this valley along the riverbanks, and our bees have access to those flowers. And I love the way that Japanese knotweed flowers taste in honey when, when bees have had a good source. So I call that woods honey when I share it with people because it's not typical Vermont honey per se. It's a little wilder. 
Yeah, it's very good. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> so the video clip that we just saw was from about a week ago. Has anything changed with the extra rainfall that we've got in the past week? Well, we're a little bit more relieved and the bees had access to a lot of water. And the most significant thing that we gained from getting that bit of rain and a little bit of snow melt is that that's going to feed the plants enough. I don't know if you might have noticed, but here after that rain, when we look up on the ridge line, all the red maple flowers are showing in the trees now. That rain was enough to boost those trees into being able to open up those maple flowers. And it was really amazing here to see how quickly that happened. So for us, that was a very joyful thing because there's something for our bees to go out and get nectar from right now. So mm -hmm. we're happy about that, but we definitely still want to keep hoping for rain. Is there anything you can do as a beekeeper to help support the bees in the unusually early spring? Well, the first thing that most beekeepers were thinking about with this spring is, are our hives running out of their own honey? The way that we keep bees is pretty old fashioned, and that means that our bees eat their own honey. We don't want to give our bees sugar water or some of the things that a lot of commercial beekeeping operations do. And that's just the choice that we've made. We want our bees to eat the honey they make. Um, so what that means is that the bees that live in the hive through the winter, and remember that's a small number of bees compared to the number of bees in a hive at the peak of summer. Um, that small number of bees has been relying on the honey they made last season in the hive for the entire winter to survive on. And a lot of hives have gotten close to finishing that honey. So the most important thing that beekeepers are checking late winter, early spring in their hives in New England is, are they running out of food? Do I need to feed them something so that they can survive until they have access to flowers and a lot of flowers that they can gather nectar from? So in our case, we can make sure they have something to eat. We're already really concerned about what this season is going to be like in 2021. Last drought summer, the 2020 season, was really difficult on the bees. And what's happening right now with this dr really drastic early spring is the bees look like they would normally look at the end of May, except the things that are there for them, like dandelions and other blossoms early in the season, aren't present for them. So we're really concerned and curious about what this is going to look like in the next month or so. And we're praying for rain. Yeah, it's really dry looking. It's very dry looking. We definitely need the moisture to come to make flowers for the bees to feed on. And there's so many other things to think about. But right now we're most concerned with that. And we're curious to see what they do when they have a spring this early because we've never seen it like this before. Yeah. Can you tell us, uh, our listeners about some of the some more specific environmental factors that stress bees or that affect them? Sadly, and as you know, probably, um, there's so many factors that are affecting bees right now. Um, the systemic use, widespread use of pesticides and insecticides in big agriculture, um, the loss of more natural habitat for bees, specific to Vermont, as dairy farms have died and those beautiful fields that cows used to be pastured in are disappearing. They're being planted more and more often with crops like GMO corn or soy. And those don't provide what bees need. They're not a healthy source of nectar for bees. There's also a lot of issues around potential navigation loss. We don't quite understand what the 5G issues do with bees. There's a lot we need to understand better about that. Um, and those things that I'm mentioning are just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other factors and they're all sort of intertwined with each other. Mm -hmm. Which one of those is the greatest? Which one has the greatest impact on the bees? I think a lot of beekeepers would answer that question by talking about the Varroa mite, which I haven't yet mentioned, but that's also sort of, uh, as I look at it, a human caused issue for bees. 
Um, Varroa mite is a pest that affected beehives in one part of the world. And because we internationally import and export things, including bee equipment and honeybees themselves and queens, that pest spread all over the world very, very quickly when bees and bee equipment were being shipped all over the world. So what ended up happening is now a pest that might have been a problem in one small location in the world is affecting beehives literally everywhere in the world. And it's a very serious pest that causes very serious health issues for bees that no one has yet figured out how to tackle. Mm -hmm. Overall, mites are important to throw in the equation. Yeah. Climate change weather is a biggie too. There's yeah. so many things impacting bees and everything impacting bees is impacting all of us as well. What is the greatest impact that climate, like the climate crisis, uh, how, how is the climate crisis affecting bees? It's really affecting them. I mean, when we complain about how our winters are different or our summers are hotter, I mean, what we're experiencing is something we're observing. But what's happening in beehives as these things take place is major. It's, it's keeping them from having reliable food sources. It's presenting them with food choices that aren't ideal for them, that make them unhealthy. The Varroa mite has already infested hives and they're already struggling to have a healthy existence. So everything else that's happening is contributing to their health issues even more. And things like eating a good diet when you're sick, it's not something that bees even can access easily anymore. What I mean by that is when we have drought summers like last summer in Vermont, a flower might come out and bloom, but it's fading in a day. Um, we don't have enough moisture in the soil for plants to have a beautiful bloom season where their flowers are out for two, three, four weeks as they normally would be. And bees are having a luxurious time enjoying those flowers. What they're experiencing is a dearth of those flowers where they're hard to find and there's not a lot of nectar in them. So that's just one example of how drought weather in Vermont can contribute to what's happening with bees. Mm -hmm. So if bees had to teach us one lesson, what do you think they would tell us? Such a good question. They're telling us, right? They're telling us that we're really in trouble and that we've shifted the way nature works to a point that we're not able to function the way we need to and that those cycles are really important. And if we don't listen to them and pay attention to them and let them occur in that process that they would be before we'd impaired them so much, what we're all experiencing is, is what we see with bees. We're just less connected to understanding that it's also happening to us as well as it is happening to the bees. Yeah, well, thank you again for talking with us and sharing all your knowledge. Thank you for interviewing me and working for Pollinator and Honey Bee Health. I really appreciate what you're doing and let's keep doing it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Yeah, thank you, I learned a lot. legislator and conservationist representative Jim McCullough from Williston, Vermont. Walking the talk to fight carbon pollution. McCullough carpooled to Montpelier from Williston for all legislative sessions from 2003 until the recent COVID lockdown. He rode his bike to the State House on Earth Day all but three years, and all his election campaigning has been on bike or walking. Good morning, Representative Jim McCullough. Thank you so much for being here with us to, for this interview today. Good morning to you, Ava, and you are most welcome. I'm very excited to be um, part of the hive. 
Um, I'm really impressed with your dedication to Earth Day for so many years. This is a wonderful example of how everyone makes a difference, and if we all do our part, together we can make, take great strides to lowering our carbon footprint as a community, society, and world. Can you tell us a bit about biking to work all the way from Williston to Montpelier? Well, it's only 32 miles from my kitchen to my, to my state capital, um, but it's generally on Earth Day, the, uh, the, the longest ride so far of the year for me, and it is, is, is quite an effort. Uh, didn't always do it exactly on Earth Day. Uh, I picked the, the, the uh, most auspicious weather close to Earth Day to do it. Um, but weather is what it is in Vermont, and I have been snowed on, rained on, uh, in spite of the fact. So, yes, it's it's always great fun. I meet up with other legislators on the way, um, and and uh, we stop for for uh, some warmth and uh, some uh, hot beverage in Middlesex, and meet up there, and uh, then make our way to the Capitol. That's awesome. All right, so I guess we're going to dive right into the questions. Um, so I understand that in addition to serving as state representative from Williston, you're also the vice chair of the House Committee on Natural Resources, Fish, and Wildlife. Are you currently discussing any legislation with this committee that might have an impact on pollinators? Well, um, we are. We've been, we've been discussing multiple um, environmental bills, all of which um, would have a, a, a uh, impact on all of our wildlife via an improved environment um, as we see concerns coming, or not con coming, concerns here now with ch climate change and continuing to come at even greater pace with climate change and migrations of people to Vermont as a result of climate change. So yes, we have been. Um, the current one we're working on is, is um, Act 250, and it affects all kinds of uh, critters, including pollinators, um, in the fact that if you can improve the land use development patterns in the state of Vermont, you can improve the habitat um, for all of the critters, including our pollinators, who are, as you are well aware, extremely stressed. They are our canary in the coal mine. So could you give me just a couple examples of some stresses that they face in Vermont? I, well, I absolutely can, um, which are, th these, these stressors are really outside the purview of Act 250, but they are totally in the purview of land use and agriculture and, and people at home, what they do on their lawns and shrubs. Um, and uh, when you spread um, certain fertilizers, when you spread certain pesticides, you are um, spreading trouble for pollinators. And, and it's not all agriculture, yes. it's, it's people with their own lawn in their own houses. There is new legislation this uh, session, um, and it's, it's H434, an act relating to establishing the Agricultural Innovation Board. And part of that bill dissolves the, the uh, Pesticide Advisory Council. Wait, so pollinators are majorly threatened by pesticides. Don't we need the Pesticide Advisory Council to protect them? You are absolutely right, Ava. Pollinators are facing extinction. Think of it. And one major reason is the uses and abuses of pesticides. And the um, Pesticide Advisory Council is supposed to be protecting all of us, including our pollinator cousins from the uses and abuses of pesticides, and they have failed miserably by many people's account, including mine. So the new Agricultural Innovation Board 
um, under the title of Regenerative and Innovative Farming, proposes to replace that board with people who have interests in protecting the pollinators, specific interests, organic farmers, citizens. And so the H434 is, is the um, bill that will ultimately replace that and we hope will do a much better job for our pollinator cousins. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, so moving on to the next question, can you tell us about the legislation that you're currently sponsoring? And could you tell us what this bill is called? Did you introduce this bill? What is in the, how does this affect pollinators? Well, the, the, the um, bill that I have introduced that has the greatest probably um, effect on pollinator health is H15, and it proposes to um, ban the use of certain um, pesticides, all of whom, or most of whom are damaging um, pollinator health. And, and uh, so that, that bill is in my committee and we, we have not been able to uh, get to discuss it yet because of time constraints. Well, um, what does the legislation process look like in general and how do bills get drafted, proposed, discussed, and voted just for some background information? Well, um, Ava, you and your peers are the future of the state of Vermont and the nation and the world. And um, I, will, I will say that legislation happens because people get involved and talk to their, um, their town select board, their town, their, you know, their, their town representation in legislature and to their congressional leaders in um, Washington, DC. And the process is reach out to them, tell them what's on your mind, A, in the beginning. So in Vermont, we need to know if you have a specific issue, likely in December, November or December, uh, to the upcoming, the, pre, the, the, the next legislative session, so that we can perhaps draft legislation that will, will speak to that. So however, um, the other ways for you to get involved are reaching out via email to your representatives, tell them what's on your mind. Um, you can go to the Vermont State Legislative website. Uh, you know how to Google that and, and find your legislator and what that person's email address is. And finally, you and I are the voice for the voiceless. Pollinators don't have a larynx and they don't have a language that we can speak, but we can see them dying by the millions. There, we are the voice for the voiceless. And I will tell you at the moment um, that good government is a participation sport. You can watch basketball on television, but if you want good government, you've got to participate and get a hold of your leadership. Yes, great advice. Um, so then for the last question is how can people get involved if they care about pollinators? Well, Answer. you know, I think that, that the um, participation sport, they've got to participate. And how do you participate? You talk to your, you talk to your um, town government, you talk to your, your legislative leaders um, and tell them we need more protection for pollinators. And, and you do that through all kinds of means, but today the most efficient means is a personal letter to your legislator. Just signing on to a form letter that an advocate organization sent you is the next best thing, but your personal words that say the same thing are most effective. All right. So, well, wrapping up, um, um, thank you so much, Representative McCulley, for being here. And I'm really glad that we have representatives in Vermont looking out for pollinators and 
doing their best to protect them. And I learned a lot from this interview. Thank you so much. Well, Ava, you're most welcome. And I can picture you now hosting 60 Minutes in not too many years. Well, we just heard from Representative Jim McCullough about pesticide legislation and the new Agricultural Innovation Board. Let's hear what Vermont Pesticide Coalition member Mike Bald has to say. Hi, Mike Bald. Happy Earth Day. It's great to have you here this morning. Thank you. Likewise. <laughs> Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you do and how your work relates to pollinators and the climate crisis? My name is Mike Bald, and I started a, a, a little one-person company in 2010, 10, 11, uh, to manage invasive species with non-chemical methods over extended time frames. And I, I really serve people who want to manage their land in the organic spirit. I only target non, non-native plants. I don't manage poison ivy and things like that, because uh, that's a native plant with a lot of positives but I work throughout the New England states and uh, so many positive experiences, uh, people doing everything from, from using goats to sharp tools to solarizing and all kinds of neat things. We've learned a lot from being out on the land and seeing how things respond. So uh, it's just all good. You asked about climate change and, and pollinators. I feel like one of the, the, the big the big positives is just increasing diversity on the on the landscape. So the, the non-natives tend to uh, to be a little pushy and crowd out some of that diversity. So the pollinators need need a, a big a big buffet line of different plants uh, flowering at different times that, that gets them served uh, right on through the the months of the growing season. And uh, diversity is important for all animals. Healthy soil and microbes and plants, they're, they're great for, they're the foundation. We protect that stuff and then the pollinators can, uh, can thrive. So according to Representative Jim McCullough, the Pesticide Advisory Council failed miserably. Um, do you agree with that statement? And do you think that the Agricultural Innovation Board proposed in H434 will do any better? And also, how does Vermont agriculture rate for environmentally friendly practices? Okay. Oh, a lot of questions. Okay. I have been attending, v Vermont has a, a pesticide advisory council. The representative did say that uh, council has failed miserably over the years. I have to agree with that because their mission statement is basically to show us how we can reduce usage over the past decades. I mean, it's, it's been about, it's been over two decades and our usage just continues to go up. It's not just agriculture. It's people spraying their driveways because they don't, they don't want to see a single weed. Um, it's recreation. It's, 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 pretty, it's all of us. It's a collective responsibility. And I would say that not only has the council failed, but from a health, Department of Health standpoint, pesticides get zero attention. Uh, it's, it's that broad. So we have failed kind of collectively as a state, but we're, we've chosen to do so freely. It's up to us to decide we want to live this way. We want pure water. We want food that does not have chemicals on it. And we want pollinators that, uh, that can help us grow crops that we can uh, use locally. Or, or so you wish there was more governmental intervention when it comes to pesticide control? I think what I would love to see, the Agricultural Innovation Board, I'm kind of like, really? Why don't we call it Agricultural Accountability Board and leave it at that? And, and that's what we're really looking for. Um, so that's kind of my comment on that bill. Um, so Jim McCullough also mentioned a pesticide bill that he introduced himself. It's called H1, H15, um, that attempts to greatly reduce pesticide use in Vermont. So can you tell us about some of these pesticides and why they're so bad for pollinators? Sure, I, I salute um, Representative McCullough for doing that. Again, that's, that's courageous and, I, and it's gonna be a process. So I would start by saying, young people like yourself, all of this legislation is about process and it takes time, it takes years. And I mean, I've been doing it for, for a long time and I've seen very little change. And it does kind of wear you down and, and a lot of people move on to, to pursue other, other, other things. So stick with it. That's the best thing all of us can do is if you have, if you're farming or if you're gardening, or if you're managing your, your 
woodland and you're doing it with goats or pigs or anything, demonstrate, take pictures and demonstrate that and share it with your representative and your senator and say, look what I'm doing here in Royalton or Randolph. De you know, show them. This is a success story. I can name, you know, East Montpelier. Uh, we got rid of a uh, giant hogweed, three acres. That's a pretty impressive patch. And I'll go back and check it this year, but no chemicals. Uh, that's right in the heart of town. No chemicals, right in a drainage going into the river. That's a success story that representatives and senators need to hear about. Regarding the pesticides in general, I would say that some of them are more, more powerful and toxic than others, but it's a cumulative thing over time. And I've never heard mentioned in recent conversations that Vermont right now has gone through two extremely dry summers. The land is already under a lot of stress. So young people, seventh, eighth graders, high schoolers should be asking when someone proposes a pesticide project, a, a project that includes using pesticide to improve a woodland or to improve habitat for birds or pollinators, why would there be chemicals in that, in that equation? The land is already under stress. Why would you add more stress to achieve some goal? Um, there's, there, are, there are better ways. You, you want me to give an example, maybe glyphosate? Glyphosate is, uh, is, first of all, has antimicrobial properties. So healthy soil is the foundation from which everything else can spring if, if the soil's alive. And glyphosate is known to disrupt the, uh, the navigation uh, ability for honeybees. So it was actually really cool to see Representative McCullough talk about bicycling to Montpelier to, you know, to save gas and to be a, a good citizen. But imagine how confused and, and how long it would have taken him to get disoriented because there's glyphosate. He's, he's sucking in glyphosate on the whole trip. Getting disoriented, taking a wrong turn, he probably would have never gotten to Montpelier. And that's what pollinators have to deal with when they fly through this, you know, this fog of uh, neonicotinoids, glyphosate, atrazine, all this stuff that's either in the air or on the plant surface or even in the, in the pollen. So are young people allowed to be on the Vermont Pesticide Coalition Board? Because that's something that would probably interest me. Sure, absolutely. The, uh, the coalition is, is just an organization of interested folks, um, people interested in the subject. And then we try, to, we try to share information and figure out what we can do together to move the conversation forward. And part of that is, is demonstrating uh, what we do, sharing what we've learned. So I think it's, it's a huge positive to share information across the generations. So yes, uh, all ages are welcome. Everyone is gonna bring something to the discussion. That's, that's powerful stuff. Wow, all right. Yeah, that'll be something good for me to get into. Yeah, so um, switching over a little bit to invasive species. Um, invasive. Do, any of the, do any of the invasive species that you eradicate provide nectar for pollinators and if so, how would you kind of balance the needs of pollinators with the overall health of the ecosystem and the desires of humans? Good question. Systems are most healthy and resilient when they are diverse. And you can walk down the middle of any stream, most streams in, in Vermont, you can walk right down the center of the stream and see nothing but Japanese knotweed on both banks. That's the one that looks like bamboo. Uh, Japanese knotweed, great for, great for honey. Everyone loves knotweed honey and goldenrod honey. And unfortunately, there would also, there would be plenty of plant life there if the knotweed was not a monoculture suppressing everything else. So we would still get good honey, good quality, non-chemically tainted honey. It's really sad to me that, that there are now pesticides in, in most samples of honey, or more than half at least. This is the FDA talking, not me. Um, so that's an example of an invasive species that is really disruptive, really creates a monoculture in sensitive areas in the state, along streams. And the bees and the pollinators, they do manage with it. But in that world I talked about, cumulative stressors and, and cumulative effects. No, it's not, it's not good to have that, such a situation so prevalent throughout the state. So kind of to wrap up, if you were trying to convince someone not to use pesticides, what do you think is your single most compelling argument? Oh, thank you for that. I, use, I, I respond this way. 
with every swing of the ax, this, this is, I'm, I'm using an example here, every swing of the ax, every stroke of the ax, you leave your signature on the land. I say with every foot, every, every footprint you make across a landscape is your signature. And I would rather my signature to be etched in sweat and presence, be in there seeing and experiencing rather than writing my signature in herbicide, in, in liquid herbicide or spraying my signature on the land. That's, the, that's, that's my presence. And I don't want my personal presence to be associated with a, a toxin on the landscape. So I just invite people, you can do this. I've tried to give people confidence. You can manage this. I was on a phone call last night and these folks south of here are doing great things to manage their knotweed. And they're, they're really learning about themselves as they learn about their land. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a, just a beautiful thing to be part of. Yeah, well, thank you. Your work is very important and I really appreciate you being here and telling us a little bit about it. Well, thank you and, and you carry on. <laughs>
and headaches and nosebleeds. My daughter used to get the nosebleeds and the headaches till we decided to choose safe technology. But these are all symptoms that a lot of people feel today and their doctors don't even know why. So, but we have some really good training for doctors now. So we're joining this conversation at just one point in time, but there are so many good things we can do to get to safe technology. And then for our poor, our poor little planet, um, the birds and the bees and the butterflies and all of our other pollinators, they have something called magnetite that helps them to navigate where they're going. So our earth also has an electromagnetic field and the birds and the bees are meant to be synchronized to that earth electromagnetic field. But now what we've done is, as mankind, we've introduced this whole layer of electro smog with these constant pulses of microwave radiation from the cell towers, from the utility smart meters, from the 5G satellites they're starting to put in the sky. Um, and it, it makes our birds and our pollinators very confused. And sometimes those signals are just the same size as our little pollinators. And that creates a really bad chemistry that can actually outright kill them. And we see that our pollinators are really declining these days. So one of my friends, Patricia Burke, just put out this article this week called More Wireless, but how do the bees vote? Because they don't have a say in what we're doing to our poor pollinators. Um, and then for, uh, we know that a lot of people are really concerned about climate change today. And what the industry doesn't really tell us is that wireless technology uses about 10 times more energy as the safe technology. So there's, there's a lot going on with wireless that we're not being told, but now we have great ways to learn. And these two documents, this is about the science. This is a friend of mine, Dr. Cindy Russell out in California. She's a surgeon and she's just really tired of having to operate on people who get tumors and stuff from this technology. So does any of this come as a big surprise to you, Ava? Yes, yeah. I was kind of aware of the iffiness of wireless technology, mm -hmm. but I wasn't fully aware of how large of an effect it can have on people, especially. Yeah, and I didn't know either until an electrical engineer girlfriend of mine at book group one night said, I think there's something up with wireless and health. So that's where I started investigating. And then my schools became the first in the United States to even have a little sign in our classrooms that says to turn off the wireless, to turn off the devices when they're not using them. And there's fine print that comes inside our devices that says, don't put this anywhere on your body. And nobody even knows that's there. So we can teach a lot. And that's really going to be the key to fixing this is just educating people. But we need to be really careful where we go for our information. Because it used to be that we had a lot of journalists who would do the deep dive and figure all this out. But now their newspapers and networks are owned by the companies that are selling us these products. So there's a lot of conflicts of interest, even with something like the New York Times, even sadly, all the way up to the World Health Organization. So for anyone who wants to dig around on that, you know, I tell people, don't take my word on any of this. Go do your research and see where you land and what you might wanna do for safe technology. But one of the best pieces that we have is, I know last year, uh, Vermont, the legislature asked Dartmouth College in their policy institute to take a look at this, but they didn't actually bring in the scientists and the doctors. They just took a look around to see what other people are doing. So their report didn't come out very good in Vermont, but New Hampshire did an excellent report. They actually brought in world leading scientists and doctors and Wi Fi experts, and they did the deep dive. And then they come up with this report that says, this is not good for us and it's certainly not good for our pollinators. So anybody can go look at that report. Um, and then they said, let's work with our senators up in Washington, DC and our Congress people and let's fix the laws that are so broken that allow all this radiation. Let's educate the public because we should all have a right to know. And then let's start tracking this radiation. How much radiation are we exposed to? 
And then let's do the really smart technology thing and just bring all the cables right to our homes and offices and schools. And then we can just pick up and plug in our laptops. We can plug in our cell phones and then turn off all those little antennas that are pulsing this radiation. So that's the good news. But for you and I, don't turn your device on except for when you really, really, really need it. Today, the industry says, woohoo, all Wi-Fi all the time. So we don't know any better. So we just leave it pulsing at us day and night. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to use something that's on your device, like your music or your games or your alarm or your clock um, or your camera, that's all on your device. You don't need to be sending signals back and forth. So keep your device in airplane mode if you're enjoying whatever's on it. And then, just like we did with cigarette smoke, we need to be really aware of our secondhand radiation. You don't want to lock your pets into the room that has the router pulsing in it all night, right? Um, and we certainly don't want to have cell phones when we're working at the beehive, because that can make the bees really angry. We've seen them swarm before when there's radiation. So we just, we need to start thinking pretty big on this. But here's what it looks like in your own home, in your house, you guys have a router and that's where the technology comes into the house from the street. All you need to do is get ethernet cables and hook them up to your devices and then just go into the devices and turn off all those signals. And then the best part though, well, the best part is it's safe, but the next best thing is you get a much better signal when it runs through a cable because sending your signal through the air, there's a lot of room for breaking down, you lose the connection, it gets slow. So there's way better ways to use technology than what we've been told. So now we just need to learn and then take care of it. So um, we need to educate our communities and I can be brought in to talk to, you know, any groups or legislators or government bodies in the town. And we can start talking about this. One town here in Massachusetts last fall, they got three boards of health in three different towns to host a forum and just start the conversation. So let's learn together. Let's talk to our town leaders because the industry keeps giving them applications to put more cell towers in. And now they're looking to put small cell antennas at the curb right outside of many people's homes. And that's gonna make a lot of people sick and a lot of animals and a lot of plants. Um, and then we need to talk to our legislators. And I love that you've already interviewed one of your legislators because they get to set up the policies for how much radiation can we have and we really need their help to do right by us. Right. So, and then anybody can go out and sign these appeals. This one with the B here is for the space appeal to stop putting all these satellites in the sky that are beaming this radiation down on us with no concern for safety. And then the scientists are actually asking us to sign a letter to go all the way to the World Health Organization and say, the rules that we have in place are not helping us or our planet. So if we can support them, they'll get the meeting with the World Health Organization. So there's wonderful things that we can all do to help this, but we just need to learn about it first. So if anybody wants to find me, you can reach me at Massachusetts for Safe Technology. There's our email address. And I also helped to set up a little nonprofit out of Europe called Wireless Education, where we took this great big issue and all the science and we distilled it down to about a half an hour course that anybody in the world can take and learn the risks, learn what the doctors are telling us. And it'll give you a little tip sheet you can, pre you can print out with handy reminders. So, so that's the quick on where we are with technology today, Ava. What do you think about all of this? Well, thank you so much for educating me. This was so interesting to watch and hear you talk about. I was not, as I said, aware of the big effects it was having, and now I'm gonna go look into getting an ethernet cable yes. to plug my device into when I'm needing it. Mm -hmm. And so also with the, appeals like to sign those and like look up stuff that I can sign to help get people active right. about it. And so, something that kids will do sometimes is they'll form a club. They'll form a <laughs> pollinator club or something. So if you ever want to do that and you want to bring me in, we can zoom again and I can teach all your friends about this. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Exactly. Oh, and one more thing. Um, so I live in a remote area, and so I haven't really thought that I was being affected by wireless signals as much as people in more rural or populated areas. And what about the satellites and how they affect everyone, no matter where your location is, and how do they affect pollinators as well? That's such a good question because right now, our government has allowed the wireless industry and others to start putting all these satellites up in the sky, that literally thousands, and we're gonna have hundreds of thousands. So not only is that gonna be you know, space debris and pollution up in the skies, but they're using for 5G a new part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I know that doesn't mean a whole lot to most of us, but right now our waves for our third and fourth generation or 3G and 4G signals, they're kind of long ways. Now, all that's left to use and to make money from are these little tiny waves called millimeter waves. And unfortunately, those millimeter waves are about the same size as our pollinators. So it's going to be completely overwhelming for our pollinators. And there's a lot of science behind this. There are studies people can look at to see exactly what this may be doing to our bees and our birds and the butterfly, all of them. So we really, if we want to keep our planet, we've really got to get ahead of these satellites as well as the rest of the cell towers and learning to use our own devices safely. All right. Thank you so much for answering that question. You're welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me in the hive today. And I hope that uh, we'll do some really good for our people and our, pollen, our pollinators and our planet. Yes, me too. Thank you so much for working on this important issue. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that does it for our broadcast. This Live from the Hive Earth Day special was produced by Emily Langsner and Arrow Vino from the Mo Mobilization for Pollinator Survival, based in northern Vermont. Please join us for our panel discussion from 7 to 9 p.m. To register for the event and find the link, go to our Facebook page, Mobilization for Pollinator Survival. All participants in the evening discussion will be entered in our door prize raffle for the lovely baby bee quilt hanging behind us. Handmade by Vermont artisan Hope Johnson. Admissions by donation. Thanks for joining us and happy Earth Day!